Well, good morning, church. How are we this morning? We good? My name's Kane Rigney, and uh, I have the, the, the privilege of being here with you all to just join in in worship and leading this morning, and I'm really excited about it. Um, I'm really excited to, to sing these, these next few songs with you all and just, just praise the Lord Jesus Christ with you all. Um, the song we're going to go into is Firm Foundation, but I want to share some scripture that's uh, on my heart regarding this, and it's from Matthew 7, verse 24, and it says, and these are the words of Jesus, too. It says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Yeah. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, right? And the rain fell and the, the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. So as we sing about Christ being our firm foundation this morning and we, we sing through this and just knowing what challenges the, the life has for us, right? If our foundation is on the solid rock of Jesus Christ, nothing can touch us and it won't fail, amen? So won't you stand with us as we, we start out the morning with worship this morning.
church. Give him praise this morning. I am so thankful for that truth this morning. He's not gonna fail, because I know where I've built my house. And so the last couple weeks I've been reflecting on 2023 and what I'm hoping for 2024, and I was reminded that my word for 2023 was peace. And by February, I felt like I had heard wrong and the Lord actually said, peace is, because nothing by February looked like I thought it was going to for my year. And so I naturally, my flesh just wanted to be frustrated and annoyed and, and fight back. And there came a point at some point in the middle of the year where I was like, what are you doing? It's exhausting to fight God. Obviously, he knows what he's doing. He's never failed me yet. And he's not going to, so give it up. Sometimes I have to be a little harsh with myself. Um, and so I can say now on the other side of 2023, now in 2024, those lyrics have never been more true for me. I've still got joy in chaos. I have peace that makes no sense, but when everything around me is shaken, and then it says some other stuff that I've forgotten, but um, those are, it's true. And so whether you walked in this morning believing those words or whether you're in a season in a storm where it's really hard to sing that song, I promise you it's true. He will never fail. And so this morning I invite you to lay that at the foot of the cross. Whatever it is you carried in with you this morning, just lay it down. You don't have to carry it, it's heavy. Set it down, he's not gonna fail you. And if you need someone to pray over you, our prayer team is here. There's a bench over here on this side. There's a bench over here on this side. I went to one of our prayer team members this morning and I was like, it just feels heavy. Will you pray for me? And she laid hands and she prayed and it didn't fix all of the things that's going on in my life, but I promise you I felt the peace of Jesus just come over me and say, I got this. So come, lay it down. Let someone pray over you this morning and continue to worship with us. Can I pray? Jesus, thank you. Thank you for walking alongside us. Thank you for your presence that is in this room already. I pray that whatever it is we carried in with us, that you would just gently nudge us and remind us that you've got it. There's no need to fear or be anxious about it, Lord, but you are in control. And you calm the storm and if the storm is raging, you promise to calm us. We thank you for that truth this morning. In your name I pray, amen.
the promise your very body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me same God and it's just that reminder of God that was and is and is to come amen he has not changed I'm calling on the God of Jacob whose love endures through generations I know that you will keep your cup I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the ocean. I need you now to do the same thing for me. Oh God, my God, I need you. God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh, rock, oh, rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. Oh, your faithfulness.
heard your children then you hear your children now you are the same god you are the same god you answered prayers back then and you will answer now you are the same god you are the same we're providing then you are providing now you are the same come on church declare it you are the same we come to you now Lord for that reminder of Lord the same God that we read about the God of Moses the God of David the God who came to visit Mary to let her know she would be with child and that that child was the Messiah Lord the, the remembering that you are the same God that exists with us right now Lord the same God we get to pray to, the same God we get to come to connect with immediately. At any time of the day, you're always available. And for the promise of eternal life because of your son, Jesus. The beautiful name of Jesus. We sing to you.
between the Gospels and the Old Testament. We just sang it. You were the Word in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word and was God, and God was the Word. Amen. We learned about that, and we see it in the New Testament as well. And we get to pro proclaim the name of Jesus this morning. Church, that should excite you. The name of Jesus, the Word, God through existence. In the beginning, in what we read through scripture, and now, present with us now, amen. Death could not hold him. Sing it out. Death could not hold you. Declare it. The veil tore before you. He silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring. The rays of the
go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, thank you for the reminder. Lord, that it's not about our circumstance. It's not about the situation we're in. It's not about anything. It's just about Jesus. Just Jesus. Church, say that with me. Just, just Jesus. Jesus. Just Jesus. And Lord, when I think about that, when I think about the, the bridge that we just said, Declaring those words, you have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. There is no rival. There is nothing that can come against you. And there is nothing equal to you. Lord, we declare that with our hearts. We declare that with our mouths this morning. And Lord, as we come to a time of teaching before we do, Lord, we're gonna lift up one more time those lyrics to you, Lord, those words, sing back to you, sing praises to you as you sit on your throne in heaven and you, you gaze upon us here, your people singing to you. You have no rival. Come on, church. You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory, yours is the name above all. One more time, you have no rival. You, you declare it, church. proclaim the name of Jesus this morning. And we offer all these things up to you and it's in the matchless, perfect, and endless name of Jesus Christ and all God's children shout, amen and amen. And I think we can celebrate the Lord a little bit better than that. He said amen. amen. I don't know about you this morning, but my heart needed that just the reminder of his goodness and that it's nothing that I can do, he's got me. My name is Peggy Orlando and I'm the communications director here and it is a privilege to be able to say welcome home. If this is your first time joining us this morning, if you'll do me a favor and either scan the QR code on the seat in front of you or visit riversidechurch.org 411. There you'll find a little button that says connect and you can tell us a little bit about yourself, how you found us, um, and we would love to get connected with you and help you take your next step here with us. So if you're with us here in person after this service, if you'll go through the double doors on your left-hand side, our first-time guest team would love to meet you, put your uh, face with your name, and help you get connected. And if you're joining us online, you can fill out that form, and someone from our guest services team will reach out to you and help you do the same just via the Internet, which is pretty cool. This is also the time in our service where we get to give back a part of what God has given us. And there are four ways for you to do that on your screen. And because of the generosity of Riverside, we have launched something new this year called Pathway. And Pathway is just one pathway. There's only one way to Jesus. And so one pathway, but we meet three times a year, three weeks at a time for this one. So January 17th, 21st, 31, 24th, sorry, I can't read. January 17th, 24th, and 31st. There you go. Um, and you can register for that at riversidechurch.org 411 on our 411 page. But some of you are like, I'm new here. I have no idea what that means. And let me tell you, so our mission here at Riverside is to make and send disciples who love and live like Jesus. 
And that key word there is disciple. And I've been here for a little while, and I know when I first got here, I was like, what the heck is that? It sounds like a big churchy word that is something that I can't attain. And that's not true. The Lord calls us to be disciples. And so we started Pathway back in October. We've done one session of it. And it is essentially teaching us how to be disciples. But it's not someone standing up here on the stage the whole time just talking at you and hoping you catch something. We clear out the auditorium and we fill it with tables and we have opportunities to have conversations in a circle about what it means to us. What is something that I'm struggling with in the, my walk with the Lord? And those kinds of things based on what we're talking about each week. This pathway is called the upside down kingdom. That in and of itself should be an intrigue because it sounds counterintuitive, an upside down kingdom. But you're gonna learn all about it and how that affects our daily life and what it looks like to run after Jesus in the upside down kingdom. And so if you haven't registered, there's still a few spots left. It starts this Wednesday and you don't wanna miss it. But if you can't be here for all three sessions, we ask that you don't sign up um, because they do build on each other and you'll just be lost if you come week two um, or week three. So if you can come all three sessions, I promise you it's worth it. We feed you dinner, it's pretty great food. There's childcare if you have littles. There's really no reason for you to not be here. We tried to do everything we could to eliminate all of the roadblocks that might be in your way. So now, now that I know how to be a disciple because I'm, I'm coming to Pathway, it's now my job to go make disciples. And that sounds like a daunting task, but we have a book called the Bible that we're learning how to read today, and it tells me what I'm supposed to do. And we have base camp coming right after Pathway that is all about how to make disciples who love and live like Jesus like our mission statement says. And it just looks at what Jesus did with his 12 disciples and how I can take that and live that out in my everyday life. So it sounds like it's big and hard, but it's not, I promise. And we break that down for you over the two days um, and just walk through what Jesus did because he had 12 guys who then told some other people, who told some other people, who told some other people and started the greatest movement ever and now I get to stand up here and share about the faith that I have in Jesus, and you get to know him too. So if you wanna learn how to make disciples, sign up for base camp on February 9th and 10th. That's all I have. Steve is here to finish out his series on how to read the Bible. Watch this. kind of dig that music because I think Yehudi put that in. Um, base camp is really good. Pathway is too, but the first time I went through base camp, there's so much and I thought, oh, it's two, a night and a whole day. Will people do this? And then we finish and like, this is worth it. It's worth it. And it makes some things that feel complicated really simple and practical. So be thinking about that if you haven't done it yet. Um, we had a guest with us today. Uh, we've been searching for a worship pastor for 10 months, is that right? And we're excited because we have two final candidates, one of those being Kane, who led us here today. Thank you, Kane. I think he came to first service. And then there is another candidate next week, so please pray for clarity and wisdom as we get closer to who God has for us and pray for that for their families because they're asking the same questions as they've opened their arms. It's, okay, Lord, where are you leading us? And it, you just make those answers really, really clear. Um, let me pray for us and we'll jump in to the word. God, I'm so grateful for your kingdom, for the church, this community of redemption that you call us into, that we don't walk this alone. And I'm grateful for the work you do all around the world and here in this room and the people 
represented here. And God, I just ask that you meet us in your word today as we learn how to read it. And you just let it bear fruit. Let it do its work in us. And we thank you for Jesus, the living word. Amen. Some of you, I know this is true, left trophies in the trophy cases of your high schools. Some of you are actively doing that right now. Your achievement was immortalized for future generations in plastic and fake wood. It's good. It feels good, right? My achievement, I was told at least a decade after high school, is prominently displayed on the wall of a senior English classroom. That's right. I was the student to correctly diagram on a giant poster the following sentence. Crest has been shown to be an effective anti-cavity decay preventative dentrophus that can be of significant value when used in a conscientiously applied program of oral hygiene and regular professional care. Yeah. You remember sentence diagramming? You remember that? I don't. I don't remember it well. This is not that sentence. I started, I thought, I love you, but I don't love you enough to relearn this. And so I got, it, it's wrong, it's awful, and I got to just help me, and I'm done. While you were good at whatever you were good at in high school, or maybe you are now, I found out I was good at words. And then I forgot all about sentence diagramming until, what is it, like 20 years later in seminary, in grad school. And we started using it for Greek. We did the entire book of Philippians in one of my classes. We had to diagram the whole book and greet and they helped us like sometimes we'd have part of the chart drawn and we had to figure it out other times on your own why did we do that it was initiation and torture at grad school that's what <laughs> now why did we do that why did they make us do that why did we diagram greek in school because observation is the key and if you really want to dig especially if you're going to stand on a platform and teach it to people you need to see how the sentences are built and how the parts fit together. Now, you don't have to diagram. You don't need to. I don't do it either anymore. However, well, I don't want to scare you, but there's a shortcut. So let's not get stuck on thinking about that. We'll get there in a minute. If you've got a Bible, open to John chapter 3. And we're going to be at verse 5 specifically. We're going to move around just a little bit. Last week, I reminded us that the Bible is built like this. You get the Old Testament, the first half that explains uh, the creation and God's plan and what went wrong and then his work to prepare them for the coming of a Savior. And the New Testament then is the coming of that Savior and Jesus and his life and death and resurrection. And the Old Testament is built in sections. It's not necessarily in order by date. You get the five books of Moses we call the law and then the history, these are narratives. They're, they tell the story of his people. And then the wisdom writings, you get books like Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. If you've ever read them, you'll go, okay, that's what a wisdom writing is. And then the major and minor prophets. These are separated just because these guys wrote longer books than these guys. They, honest to goodness, ordered it from thick to thin. You had the thick books, the thin books. It's not that one's more important. That's just how it was built. And then the New Testament... We get the law again, but now it's the new covenant through Jesus and the, what we call the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that tell the life, death, and resurrection. They tell what happened. And then the history book that picks up there and explains now that the Spirit had come, uh, how does the church take root and spread? And then Paul's letters, you'll see them called epistles sometimes. That just means letters in Greek. I think that's right. Uh, and then some of the other letters from the other writers like Peter and James and then one book of prophecy at the end. And John, one of Jesus' 12 disciples, you can find it here in this section in the Gospels. So if you're scrolling or you're on paper, work your way to there. John I mentioned this last week. It's a really good place to start reading. If you've never read a Bible, there's tons of places you can start. I highly recommend John. It just explains it all. Jesus is quoted so often in John. You just learn who he was and what he was about. Good place to start. Today, we'll be in chapter 3, verse 
5, and it goes like this. Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Well, what does that mean? Oh, hang on. Before we get to what it means, we need to talk about what it says, not what it means. We start with observation. And something that's really helpful, especially when you get into verses that are a little more complicated, is to make a really simple structure layout. Not a diagram. You know, I diagram a sentence. But sometimes when you're trying to figure out how it fits together, what is modifying what, what clauses, are, you can just, this really slight, low effort outline. For example, like you just start right, rewriting it. And I did it like this. Jesus answered. And he's going to say two things, truly, truly, which was often used by rabbis at the time. It's like, what, I'm, verily, verily, if you go back to the King James, but it's just, hey, this is what I'm telling you is important. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and, here's I separated the two pieces, there's an implied of the Spirit, so there's a two-piece thing, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. It's just really simple, breaking that down and it in the thoughts, especially when you're trying to get your arms around it or when it gets more complex. Like next week, we're going to be back in the book of 1 Corinthians and my little drawing looks like this. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Those are two in contrast. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who is within you, whom you have from God, and there's an and in the Greek, Kai, you are not your own. Do you not know? There's two things you don't know, that your body is a temple and you're not your own. For, why aren't you on for? You were bought with a price. So, big conclusion, glorify God in your body. It's going to be a little spicy next week, so if you've got young children, you may want to put them in the kids' ministry. This is my warning. I'll be careful, but we're going to read it and see what it says. And it exposes things like how there's this two things about the Holy Spirit. He's within you, and he was a gift from God. God's Spirit lives in you. That's why or how you're a temple. That's why he talks about it that way. You're a temple. that God dwells in you. So it's helpful to just take time and structure it when you're having a hard time with one of the sentences. Occasionally on passages where I'm going to teach it, and guess I'll do that on the whiteboard out in the office, or I'll just write it out and, and go through and mark the nouns and the verbs and see, okay, how is this fitting together? What is going on? Okay, now, Jesus answered. What's that mean? That he answered. What, and what he says, truly I say to you, unless one's born of water and of the Spirit. What's he mean? But really good practice is to back up a little bit and check the context. So we've got one verse, but it's written in a paragraph. And we look at the paragraph, and then we ask some adverbs. You guys remember adverbs? Yeah, you don't have to remember adverbs. Most of them start with W's. So you could actually say, ask the W's, the five W's. Who, what, where, when, and why, and then sometimes you also ask the H, how, how. So if we go back to verse 5 and we try this and we asked who, because we realize Jesus answered, you think, well, who's he answering? Oh, that's an important question. Who's he talking to? And we get part of the context all the way back to verse 1. It says, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, ruler of the, a ruler of the Jews, it's like, oh, he's answering Nicodemus. That's good, because that's one of those Bible names you can pronounce, too. It's like, yes, I can say Nicodemus. I can even abbreviate it. Nick, I can hang on to that. But what? What's a Pharisee? What is that thing? Um, here is where some of the tools become useful. Some of the other books written about the Bible or a study Bible. Or in this instance, I would recommend a Bible dictionary. This one is available. You can buy it in print or digitally. It's literally a dictionary. It has all the unfamiliar and many of the familiar words. Like if the Bible men mentions Mary, have you ever been reading and it like mentions Mary and you realize like there's a lot of Marys. Which Mary? You can look up Mary in a Bible dictionary and it will list them all and tell you what we know about her and where that is in the Bible. It'll show you that. It's like, okay, there's this Mary and this Mary and this Mary. And it's like, oh, that's helpful. That helps me sort that out. 
It lists and shows them. It has places in there like Shechem. It's like, oh, that's a person and it's a place. It has the measurements and money like cubits and shekels. It tells you what that stuff means. And in mine, mine's digital. It has this beautiful hyperlinked entry on Pharisees. And it links to words like Sadducees, which is another group they're often compared to. And so I can click there and look up the other word. Um, Even simpler, you don't have to buy a Bible dictionary. There's an excellent website. Now be careful with websites. Some that seem Christian aren't, or it's a sect, or it's this really obscure view. It's like, we don't believe that stuff. So be careful with that. But this one, gotquestions.org, I really like. It's good. It, it tells you on the thing. This is the front page. When you go there, there's not a whole bunch of confusion. There's one place. You just type in your question. They have 750,000 questions answered in there. You can go there and type, what is a Pharisee? I did this. And you get 388 results, which is too much. But the first one is the right one. You click that first one, and there's even a video. It writes it out. There's a video that explains what a Pharisee is. And that's the first adverb that we hit in there, who. And when you get stuck in the Bible, it's a great place to go to a site like that and go, oh, what is a Pharisee? What is this word I don't know? Where is this place? Is that on a map somewhere? He's speaking to Nicodemus. And what did he say to Nicodemus? You have to be born of water and the Spirit. What's that mean? Why did Jesus answer like that? Well, back in verse 2, so we're in 5, back in 2, this man came to Jesus and, uh, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. This is what Nicodemus said. Now, if you don't know what the word rabbi means, how could you look that up? Gotquestions.org, you figure out what's a rabbi? Well, it's just a teacher. That was a word for a Jewish teacher. And Nicodemus tells him he knows that he has come from God. He's been sent by God. And then Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Whew. Let's get strong. Jesus just jumps, cuts to the chase, right? Nicodemus says, we know you're from God. And Jesus says, unless you're born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. Whew. That confused Nicodemus like it does many of us. And Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? It's a valid question. Nicodemus is asking one of the adverbs. He asks, how? You say this, how is that possible? And that leads to verse five. And Jesus says, unless one's born of water and the spirit, he can't enter the kingdom of God. So he's starting to explain, what do you mean by born again? Well, there's two births he's gonna mention in here. And in the next verse, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. He's describing two births. One's by flesh, one's by spirit which we think that's what he's talking about when he says water and spirit. He's just using, he's tying those concepts together. You can look up words like flesh and spirit, and if you think, well, is this the same word, or where else does the Bible talk about that? You can use a thing called a concordance, or you can go to one of these two websites, like biblegateway.com or thebluelletterbible.org, and you can type in a word, and it will show you everywhere in the Bible that word shows up. So here, like... Um, in this room, when I teach, you can say, well, is this word flesh the same as that word? And it is, and you can check it there. But sometimes I'll put on the original language. Sometimes we mention it. Sometimes it's just there as bonus if you want to look that up. And I usually, I almost always, but now and then I forget to update it, so it might be the wrong ones, but I put these little numbers in. And this little S stands for Strong's. Uh, this guy, years ago, numbered all the words in the Bible. He did all the Hebrew, he did all the Greek, so you can just look them up by the number at a place like Blue Letter Bible. You type in Strong's number, and it will show you that word, and it'll show you everywhere it's used. And like if it says, love your neighbor, it's like, well, what word? There's different words. Is that that agape word I've heard? What word for love is Jesus using here? It's like, that's a way to look that stuff up. Okay, that's extra, but that's how you do it. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. He describes the two birth, one by the flesh, one by the spirit, so we can assume that when he talks here about water and the spirit, water is just, it's called a metonymy. It's a term describing human birth, and, or the flesh, and then spirit is spirit. If you want to enter the kingdom of God, you must be reborn, born again, 
born a second time, a spiritual birth, birth by the Spirit. And what's the kingdom of God? It's another good question. You can look that up on one of those sites. You can dig through, find all the places Jesus talks about it. He talks about it a lot. It may take you a minute to, to do that, to study it. A short answer is it's the kingdom where Jesus is king. He talks about this. He talks, it's the place where he reigns. You, you are given the option to become a citizen in his kingdom. But to be a citizen in his kingdom, you must be born again. Spiritual birth. Now, when did he say that? That's another adverb. It's handy sometimes. I go, when was this happening? Well, we, this is chapter three. This is early as Jesus has gone public. But also, if you go back where we met Nicodemus in verse one, it says, oops, it says Jesus, this man came to Jesus by night. Nick, at, I'm not gonna make that joke, but that's the joke. Nick at night. I did make it. <laughs> Why? Why did he come at night? It's another adverb. It's a really good question. And it's probably significant because they put it in there. It's like, I wonder why they single out that he visited him at night. Did Nicodemus have something to lose? He did. Was Nicodemus afraid? Probably. Was there danger? Possibly. Because many of the other, of that ruling class, they get really upset about what this guy Jesus is claiming. And Nicodemus seems to be sneaking off to ask Jesus questions. He seems to be seeking. He wants real answers. It's a really good question. And I mentioned that as you do this and you break down just one verse or one little passage, it may take a while. So much so that you might not do it all in one day. You might do a little bit at a time. Uh, and something I want you to know about reading the Bible is you can go slow. As a matter of fact, you should go slow. As in, sometimes this feels so intimidating and you think, I've got to master that entire book. It's like, you can camp on one verse for a while. That's okay. Take John 3, that verse 5 that I put up and just camp there for a few days or maybe even weeks. Linger in it. I had a discussion recently. I've got a friend that has a group of us over once a month and he sets up a topic for the night and we spent over three hours one night on being born again. And what does that mean? And we weren't done. But we had three whole hours just on that one phrase. We ruminated. We chewed on it. Any of you guys have cows? You got cattle? You spend much time with cattle? Um, they eat grass and hay and they chew it. And then they chew it and they chew it. And then they swallow it. And then they um, bring it back and chew it more. And then they swallow it. And then they retrieve it again and chew more. They thoroughly chew it. They'll chew that same clump of grass, a cud, and they break it down. We call them ruminants because they ruminate their food they go over and over the thing. You can do the Bible that way. Like, don't eat it, eat it, but chew on it. Linger. Take in one passage and let it have its effect. Put that all the way in. Devour it. There's precedent for this. Uh, at the beginning of the book of Psalms, the first words of the songbook in the Bible, it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Blessed is the one who meditates on the law of God. I showed you earlier on that chart, the law or the five books of Moses. That's shorthand for it and for much of the Old Testament. So for us now in the New Testament, we would consider the same thing to be true for the, the New Testament, the words of Jesus and the words that were given by the Holy Spirit, the whole of Scripture meditates on it, like chews on it. You can sit on one verse for a while. It's okay. Some of you have a hard time reading. You get one verse and just stay there for a few days. It's all right. The word meditate, uh, the Hebrew word, haga, 
it means to mutter when it's used of humans, but if it's used of animals, like this is used of pigeons sometimes, and it would refer to the pigeon cooing, the ooh, ooh, that worked better first service. And, or uh, the way that a young lion would growl, not roar, just the growl. I don't know how to do that. But when it's applied to humans, it's muttering. This person is you repeating the words, not grumbling like a bitter old man. Don't do that. I, I, it's more familiar now than it used to be. But <laughs> mutter, like there's a thought you can't get out of your head. It's just right there in the front of your mind, and you're rehearsing it over and over. You're chewing on it like a low growl, meditating on the word. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of the... Just carry it around. To do that, two things have to be true. One, you have to go slow and get it in there. And two, you got to take it with you. So like either write it out and carry it or take a screenshot of it or make it your screen state, whatever, or even better, memorize it. Put it all the way in. Take it to heart. It's a great pact practice for 2024. Choose a passage or a verse and carry it all year. You can do more than one, but one is a really good start. It's worth celebrating. Put one inside, in somewhere deep. Now, that is a lot about being born of both water and the Spirit. I feel like we have exhausted that verse. I look at it. I think we have observed it. We've interpreted it. We should probably wrap up now and just go home, right? Because that's what the Bible's for, just to read it and talk about it, right? No, no. Not at all. We're skipping a really, really important step. When Jesus was confronted by Satan in the wilderness, he was weak, he was alone, and Satan propositioned him, he tempted him, told him to make food for himself, and Jesus said to the devil, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. We read last week that the scriptures are breathed out by God. The Bible comes from the mouth of God. It is bread, sustenance. It's a source of life. It's to be taken in, eaten, and then it is to change you. This nourishes you so you can grow from it. The apostle Peter in one of his letters, he reminds us that the written word and the person of Jesus have worked together in us and having purified your souls, this is in 1 Peter chapter 1, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart since you have been born again, not of perishable seed but of imperishable through the living and abiding Word of God. The principle when you're reading this and studying it, Scripture doesn't contradict itself, but it will often build and clarify itself. The, the Word of God is the mechanism through which we are born again. This is how it comes to us, the living and abiding Word of God. So the person of Jesus, but also the revelation about Jesus and Jesus told us you have to be born again or you can't see the kingdom of God to enter the kingdom of God you must be born again so here's a great big question for application are you have you been born again because the primary application of this passage Jesus is having a conversation with Nicodemus. He's not just trying to make him think about something or to consider whatever. He's trying to call him to examine his life and ask this question, and what will it take for me to be born again? If you want Jesus, you must be reborn. We can observe and interpret. We can discuss it, chew on it, but there is a rebirth that is necessary, a dying and then a birthing that is set as significant and maybe more significant than the birth that brought you into this world in the beginning. There has to be a birth of the Spirit through the living Word. Have you experienced that? Yes. The Bible will go on to clarify as you read it. 
Just two chapters later, back in John and chapter five, Jesus will say, he, he just cuts to the chase. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. You enter it by being reborn from death to life. You're alive, you die and are reborn. You do that by hearing and believing. I wrote out a little structure diagram of this because it, it breaks it down and it shows you have to do two things. You hear his word and believe him who sent me, right? His word is the scripture. This is what he revealed to us. And who sent him? The Father. So you're believing what the Father has said about him. You believe what God says about Jesus. When you do that, you have eternal life. The one who does that has these are really strong words. It does not say might have, can hope for, can possibly maybe look forward to if all these other conditions are made. It says have. The moment you believe in him, you put it in Jesus, has eternal life, does not come into judgment. It doesn't say doesn't come into judgment unless you screw up. It doesn't say that. It says does not, but has passed from death to life. You something has fundamentally changed. There's a rebirth, has eternal life, enters his kingdom then. You won't be judged because you're judged right then when you cry out to him for mercy. Jesus, I believe, save me. He judges you then and he makes you his. So rebirth has passed. We talk about application. The big question in application is what does this change? What's it affect? Well, this changes everything. You go into this passage and think that changes everything. You who have not believed, you who have not yet turned from yourself and turned toward him to put your trust in him and you're ready, I'd love for you to come meet with their prayer team and they will walk you across the rest of that line. They'll walk through this, they'll pray through it with you and let you declare to Jesus, I believe, save me. You can do that now. I'll bring that back up as we close in a few minutes. You could use that time, make that decision. That's the chief application of this passage. If you've not been born again, you need to be. That's how you enter his kingdom, his eternal kingdom. You cross over in that moment. So as you read the scripture, as you meditate, as you chew on it, as you observe and interpret, you must also apply. And one great way to do that is to ask this question. Uh, how does it affect, there's two or three things, how does it affect what I think? Have I been wrong? Have I thought, well, you get to heaven by being a good person? Or you get, this changes the way you think. Jesus says you get in my kingdom by being born again. That's how you do it. You won't see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. So maybe you've been wrong in your thinking and you need to correct your thinking. That's the application. You start thinking differently about something or you start, stop thinking some way that you were thinking or maybe you continue in something you had been taught. It's like, oh, right, here's where it said it. Okay, that's right, I'll continue to believe that. Or maybe you ask, how does this affect what I feel? Am I convicted? I read this and I think, oh, wow, I've got something to do. I, I have this issue in my life, I'm gonna to have to deal with it. God's revealed this to me. Or maybe you feel relief or gratitude. Or maybe it surfaces a place where, oh, I, I've got a person I may have to forgive. I have sin that I haven't been honest with God about. And then finally, you're asking, how does it affect what I do? So how do I think and feel and what do I do? How I live, how I act or behave? Do I need to make a change? Like in other passages, maybe there you're convicted and like, I'm gonna have to forgive that person or I'm gonna have to ask for forgiveness. Whatever that is, you, it gets to that place where, okay, this may affect the way I live now. What do I need to, sorry, I skipped the punchline. Wait, go back, go back. I animated that doggone thing. I can't rewind it. <sighs> you ask that question. What do I need to do? How does it affect how I live? And then, there you go. Once you know it, this is the key. Is there something you need to start, stop, or continue? Then you do it. You have to actually act on it. 
James told us faith without works is dead. It's useless to know the truth and not be affected by it, just to read the Bible, to observe, to interpret, but to fail to apply it. You're just wasting time. There's a handout at your seats today. Don't be intimidated by all the words on that. Most of those are just explaining like the adverbs are there, the five W's, and then a little question with each. So, and there's not really enough room to write on this. Um, but here's a way to do this thing we've talked about the last two weeks. Some questions. You, you could use this. You can adapt it. You may take some of these questions and make your own, like put headings in a journal. Uh, and if you're intimidated, start with John 1.1, 1, 1, what we did last week. Those, that's profound. You could camp for days or weeks just on those first few verses. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Wow. Just sit there if you need to. It's okay to go slow and chew on it. It tells us it's living and active. You can meditate on it. And if you want to go a little deeper in this How to Study Your Bible, there's a great book called Living by the Book. This is the guy who taught me. Howard Hendricks wrote this before his death. It's an excellent overview of how to go deeper when you want to go deeper. So 2024, I challenge you, read the word, observe it, interpret it, and apply it. Let it take root and do its work in your life. Let me pray for us. And then I'll dismiss this, and then I'm going to call up Dan. Dan, if you want to start your way, he's got a couple of instructions for us after a second service. So let me pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, not only have you done these things for us, have you come for us, have you prepared a kingdom that you invite us into, but you explained it, you wrote it down. Lord, grow a hunger in us for that word to devour it, to be consumed by it, to spend time meditating in it, hearing from you. And use it, Lord, for your purposes. Let it bring effect in our lives. And we thank you for Jesus, the living word, in his name, amen. Okay, these are words from the book of Hebrews. It's a place you can find if you look that up on that chart. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen.